think of an investor like a marriage. Oftentimes, the entrepreneur thinks that that sort of the investor is sort of above them somehow. But really, if it's more like a marriage, like you're trying to map the entrepreneur to the best possible investor. And if you have an amazing company, then you deserve an amazing investor. An amazing investor is going to have experience which can benefit the company. And preferably, it is past experience. Like, oh, I've invested in hundreds of restaurants. I know what works, what doesn't, how they control labor costs and food costs and this and that and do marketing. Why wouldn't you want an amazing investor like that? All right, my good man, T.A. McCann, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here, bud. So good to see you. I got a, I got a point to our previous episodes. Very, very popular. Uh, it was fun for me to bring you on uh, as not only a business icon, but as a friend and mentor. I feel like we've got a, a great rapport uh, the show is a popular one. And just to retrace a couple of the things that we talked about, we talked a lot about how to decide whether or not your business, uh, since most of the people who are listening are creators, entrepreneurs, um, solopreneurs, you know, ranging from small businesses to aspiring startup founders, you know, how to decide the business that you have, whether, you know, should you just bootstrap it? Should you go, you know, full on venture capital? And one of the, you know, the big questions that I took away from our last one was around how, uh, how ought people think about getting to, into a relationship with someone who could possibly fund their business. We talked about what kinds of funding there are, and I want to focus today's efforts on specifically coaching those people who are listening who do want to seek some sort of funding, um, how to go about it. So uh, before we dive into that, though, that's today's topic. Give everybody the 60-second background on you in case they missed our earlier episode. Yeah. Well, in terms of uh, the relevance for this particular topic area and today is uh, I'm a five-time founder uh, with three successful exits, uh, and therefore I've been through the process of raising capital, scaling companies, and selling companies, uh, returning capital for my investors. So I've sort of seen what that looks like and also shutting companies down. So I've seen what happens when you can't raise money for a company. And then about five years ago, I joined Pioneer Square Labs. And Pioneer Square Labs is a startup studio and a venture capital firm. On the startup studio side, you can think about that as an, as an incubator where we come up with new ideas for venture scale types of businesses, create them, spin them out of the studio and help them get funded. I'm also a venture capital investor, so I sit on both sides of the table, sometimes creating companies and trying to raise money alongside the CEO for those companies, as well as being the venture investor listening to that entrepreneur pitch. And on the venture side of our business, we invest in the companies we start. Uh, we also invest in companies that we don't start. So we are focused on the Pacific Northwest. We write 500 k to $2 million checks for venture scale software ideas. And so I hear lots and lots of pitches, but then I also create lots and lots of pitches as well. Good. And that makes you, in my mind, uniquely qualified. Not only do you have both the studio side and the venture side, but you have the entrepreneur side and the venture side, which, you know, are, if we're talking about like Dungeons and Dragons, we have a many sided die. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, all of those, uh, you know, excellently through and through. And so given I referenced earlier our last show. If you haven't checked that out and you're listening to the show today or watching, um, it's really valuable because it helps people. I mean, I got a lot of DMs that were saying specifically like, oh my gosh, I've always wondered if my business was something that ought that I ought to get financing to grow or not. And the show was really helpful. So if we take that and just assume that people are, that was the 101. And so today is the 102. You decided that your business would benefit from capital. And we've talked about all the different types of capital. There are bank loans, there's sort of family office money, there are uh, there's venture capital funds, which are aiming to grow large scaled companies. What kinds of ways ought entrepreneurs who are listening, watching, think about finding people who might be good matches for their business, number one. And then number two, what are the steps to go to sort of pitch them? Let's talk about this stuff in the nitty gritty. Yep. On the last show, we referenced this sort of concept of founder, idea, investor, outcome, fit. 
Mm -hmm. So many people who've done this have thought of that, the founder idea fit. That's quite commonly sort of talked about is like, is this person a great founder for this particular kind of idea? Uh, and then if you match that sort of idea to investor and outcome fit, meaning a certain type of investor is thinking about, do I want to two times my money or five times my money or 10 times my money over what period of time am I looking to buy equity or get a recurring revenue stream? So this is a, this is a concept of sort of matching your idea to the investor and the type of investor. And oftentimes the investor is mapped to a certain type of outcome. Like how big does it need to be over what period of time? And I think we'll spend majority of our time talking about, let's call it professional venture type of investors. And therefore it turns a certain kind of business idea and it takes a certain kind of founder to map to that investor and the outcome fit. And all those things are going fit, to sit, sit together. When we then dissect the investors into a, slightly different, smaller categories. There are angel investors, of which I'm an active angel investor uh, as a viewer as well. Mm -hmm. And angel investors tend to be individuals investing their own money uh, into businesses. And in this particular case, they may be investing it into early stage technology types of companies. Most early stage investors who are angels are writing 10 to 100K checks. Uh, they're usually doing three to 20 deals a year. And they've gotten to be somewhat professional, but they tend to be investing their own money. Uh, second to that, alongside that, maybe a family office. So if I were particularly wealthy, I might hire somebody to run my family office to invest my own money, but it would look start to look more like a venture investor. So a Jeff Bezos has a family office and called Bezos Expeditions. And so that's sort of his money or their money that's being invested, but there's a professional investing their money. If you step up one ne next level there, you're now getting collections of other people's money that is being managed by a person making investment decisions. You could think of these as sort of seed funds oftentimes, and this is now professional money, and they're starting to think more like a venture investor, and then you move into normal venture capital, and those can be larger and larger pools of capital that are being invested by professionals in other companies. And so you know, I'm both an angel investor and I'm a venture capital investor. So investing my own money out of my own bank account, but also investing out of a fund called Pioneer Square Ventures. Uh, that is a collection of other people's money that is trying to get a return. So those are, those are categories of investor, of, of investors, all of which will fit together into the narrative of an invest, a, a venture scale investor or an investor pitch. Because whether you're an angel investor or you're a venture investor, the narrative for the founder will be quite similar. Great, great. Let me recap those those four. And I want to get a clear name on number three. So number one, we're going to call angel investing, individual who's investing his or their money. Number two is a family office, uh, you know, Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, um, Sarah Blakely, they have family offices. There's a person who's in charge of investing Sarah Blakely's money or investing Jeff Bezos's money. And then the third one is a, a collection of those, someone who manages a bunch of families' monies, or how else would you categorize that? And let's get a crisp name for that one so we can have a good nomenclature going into the episode. Yeah, I'm going to just call this one seed funds. And seed okay. funds, they tend to be each one of these could sort of be bucketed into effectively the check size, right? So angel investors might be 25, 10K to 100K. A sort of family office might be 100K to a million. Uh, seed fund might be, you know, 100K to a couple million. And then now you're starting to step up into venture funds, which will be millions of dollars at, you know, a million or millions of dollars on a per check per investment kind of level. Got it. So the fourth one, again, would be the venture. So we'll go, uh, again, don't mean to be too pedantic here, but angel investor, uh, family office, seed fund, venture capital fund. Okay. Yep. So if we use those as sort of the four corners of our square for our conversation today, you've already mentioned that there's a lot of overlap right there, that the way that some of those people think is similar. I would like you to articulate the ways that they're similar and the ways that each of those differ from one another a bit. Yeah. So in terms of the way they think similarly, usually the angel investor 
and or the family office and or the seed fund are all planning to invest in venture scale companies. And so at some point, whether they are early in its company's life or later, there is going to be a venture investor involved. And therefore, they're trying to invest in companies that are of size, of a certain size and of a certain scale and of a certain growth rate that are venture scale ideas. And therefore, even though you may be pitching an angel investor, that angel investor is like, okay, cool. So I'm going to participate in a funding round, which is a collection of investment at any given time. I'm going to participate in that. And there are likely to be other seed funds or family offices or venture investors involved in the, that specific round or in the future round. So they're thinking about it while they may be making an individual decision. They are thinking about it similarly as, is this a venture scale founder? Is this a venture scale idea? Are they going to execute in this way? And when and who will they have involved as future venture investors? Got it. So the way they may the, think yeah. differently okay. is their decision making. So usually a, an angel investor is making the decision all by themselves. They may have broader thematic opportunity. So I don't know, I just like these kinds of people, or I just like this kind of idea. And they have lots of opportunity to invest in whatever they want to, right? It's their own money. As they start to become venture investors, they tend to have more thematic thought process. Like they may have a geographic focus, as we do with the Pacific Northwest. They may have, a, I only invest in healthcare. I only invest this size of check. And so there may be more specificity that as you move into that venture world, uh, somebody may have. And, and, and you may find that with angels as well. But the angel, because it's really only them making the decision, they can, they can be much more variable uh, and less thematically driven. Got it. So to the similarity point, I think this is something that is often misunderstood. A lot of people that I speak to, uh, and to be fair, these are these tend not to be there, I would say, listeners from today's show, but that I bump into after giving a keynote or something, or they write into me, or I see a you know DM question from them. They're chasing money that for their business with them as a creator, or I want to start a chain of uh, health food stores, or I want to start a, a series of, you know, I want to sell supplements. I want to build my own business around a, supplements. And we use this example in our previous uh, recording together. And where I see them trip up is that they're seeking to meet other angel investors, say people who write those size checks. But where they miss is that they don't understand that their business doesn't actually aspire to be venture scaled. So they miss the fact that, oh, this is not just a one-time investor from a friend who's going to, you know, angel invest in my startup. That angel investor, if they went to say angel list, which is a, you know, a really popular place where you might find angels, or if they know some people in their network who they know invest what they what they miss is that if someone has that moniker on their nameplate they're largely thinking that i'm going to put the first or early money into this company this company is going to grow and separately seek different amounts of funding in future rounds of funding and someday be the next fill in the blank billion dollar multi hundred million dollar company so to those people the people who misidentify that, what would you tell them their options are? It's like, well, oh, I don't want that. I just want, you know, four stores. I want one in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, and LA, and it's a coffee shop. What do you tell those people who I think often misunderstand they seek venture or they seek angel or think they are pitching venture funders or venture capitalists, but they really ought not to be? Where would you steer them? What would you tell them? Yeah, I'm not an expert on what I might call small business funding, but let's call these small businesses, right? The okay. restaurant, the health food store, the gym you want to open. Uh, there are probably way better people that you'll get to answer the questions on small business funding. I would say I'm near expert on the venture capital part of it. Mm -hmm. But regardless of this, you can start to do this mapping of an investor's previous success or their stated themes. 
So if like, oh, great, I love health food stores, or I love small business retail, or I love restaurants or whatever. I mean, we know a few restaurateurs and each one of those people have investors. Mm -hmm. And the investors that they have are usually people who are either particularly interested in the entrepreneur, or they have experience investing in restaurants. And they know what to look for, and they know a good one from a bad one, and they have a specific plan. And so you're really, as a founder, I would start to look for where is the person that has had past success investing in the thing that I'm building? And it could be the four chain store that you're talking about. That's generally not an angel investor. It's not usually a venture investor. Mm -hmm. It could be an angel investor. It could be somebody who thematically is like, oh, I've always wanted to have a better supplement company or supplement store down the street. And therefore, I'm thematically oriented toward this idea or structurally oriented, like I understand retail and I understand invest in lots of retail concepts and you're a retail concept and I like that particular kind of concept. But the financial profile of that company will be in such a way that they've probably seen it many, many, many more times. They understand all the details of same store sales and leases and cost to run those things and on and on and on, the unique parts of that type of business. So my advice to that founder is pick something that's kind of like you that's already been successful and then reverse engineer for who were the investors in that thing that's already kind of like you. And this could be a gigantic software company, or it could be a four-store retail chain or a restaurant, and then go find the person because many investors are really creating their own pattern recognition. They're like, I love restaurants. I want to invest in more restaurants. I know what a good one and an average one is. I know how to make money and I would lose money. And therefore, if you're doing your next restaurant concept or a four chain, four store chain or a software company, then I am, you're looking for the investor who has really good pattern recognition because they've done it lots of times. Mm. And they're also, I'll, I'll make this point and we can come back to it, but think of an investor like a marriage. Oftentimes, the entrepreneur thinks that, that sort of the investor is sort of above them somehow. But really, if it's more like a marriage, like you're trying to map the entrepreneur to the best possible investor. And if you have an amazing company, then you deserve an amazing investor. An amazing investor is going to have experience which can benefit the company. And preferably, it is past experience. Like, oh, I've invested in hundreds of restaurants. I know what works, what doesn't, how they control labor costs and food costs and this and that and do marketing. Why wouldn't you want an amazing investor like that? You deserve an amazing investor like that. And therefore, you're looking for somebody who has past success, past experience, and think of it like a marriage. Mm, Love that. So I'm going to play something back to you in part to make a point uh, in case folks missed it, that this concept of deconstructing is if I'm out there going to make a supplement company. The goal is to look at in the market, who has a company that looks and kind of smells like what I want to build and, and then learning about that company, deconstructing, if you will, the idea behind who were their investors. First of all, did they have investors or did they grow organically? Did they bootstrap it? Is the person who started the company super rich or does he have a, you know, a rich aunt or something like what to me, this is a, 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 often, again, a thing that is completely misunderstood or people skip over this thinking it's just too easy. It's it's like, that's not a good way to start. And yet, I think all of the best stuff that I've done has had models out there in the world. I might not want to build that exact company or product. I want to build something different, but there is something enough like it and like to say that success leaves clues, right? So this was very successful. What are the clues that I can take away from looking at the starting story? This is, you know, I have read hundreds of biographies of entrepreneurs. I started out as an artist deconstructing the life of a successful artist. I deconstructed all sorts of, I read books and biographies and autobiographies of artists. And so in this idea that success leaves clues, where would you suggest that people start? Because, you know, they don't even know I'm, 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 if you're the average podcast listener to the show and we're talking about investors, they don't know. They don't know, like, well, where would I go to find out, you know, who started, um, you know, GNC supplements? Again, terrible example. I'm, I'm, we, we should, <laughs> but like who? who, who we'll we'll go know? with it. We'll go. With OK, it. OK. Just an example. We're not saying it's a good idea or not. That's not right. the point. But I think in all cases, I would do two things. 
One is I would say, what is the company that's kind of like my company that's already quote unquote been successful? And you could define success in a lot of ways. If in a venture, in a venture sort of way, we would look at a company that's already exited, which means it's been acquired or gone public for probably north of a hundred million dollars and preferably more, right? A 300 million, a 500 million or a gone public kind of company. What, what company is kind of like mine? That is in that. And it doesn't have to be the same thing. So let's say you're doing a hospitality company and you're like, well, I don't know, there's Airbnb. That's kind of like my company, right? And and there may be many more like that. So, okay, reverse engineer from that and find out what is similar to me and what might be different about what I'm doing. The second is go after the founders. So usually this, you know, what company is kind of like mine uh, and has already been successful. It's usually not just one. There may be two or three or four from slightly different perspectives. Right? Is Airbnb the only hospitality company? Is it even a hospitality? Oh, it's a travel company and a hospitality company. Oh, it's a hotel company and a travel company. So you could find different examples of companies that are similar to you, but have already been successful. And then also you could do very well by finding the founders of those companies who by their very nature are now much wealthier than they were when they started. <laughs> and you could imagine that those people might like to be angel investors too. Oftentimes, once founders have been successful, and by the nature of what we just talked about, they are now successful, they oftentimes start writing those $25,000 checks. And if you were doing another company that was in the hospitality space, the travel space, and you got Brian Chesky to invest in it, and you had Brian Chesky, you could send him an email and ask him questions about it, you're already a better company. Mm -hmm. You're already smarter. And why wouldn't you want Brian Chesky to invest in that company? And I could make a list. You could do the same thing for any particular category of the thing you are, who is the already successful founder or founders, meaning might be senior people at those companies too, who mm -hmm. oftentimes are angel investors and or the investors who were in those companies previously. So who were the people who invested in Airbnb when it was, ba when it was just a baby, just getting going because those people made a lot of money too. And they've now started to develop pattern recognition, understanding of the market and presumably can be really helpful to you in addition to the money. And the money is just sort of like generally most entrepreneurs, the first timers, they're thinking that the money is the most important thing. It's not. What's important is the access to knowledge. And the person who's already tried 40 different things to make the restaurant successful or the other things successful. So access to knowledge and imagine that you could put all those names on your list, your cap table your your set of investors and presumably get knowledge from them in addition to capital. Mm. Okay. At, let's see here. To me, that's fascinating. The, you were deconstructing the idea of uh, who other folks have been successful. We, you glossed over it, but there are other, in, the people invested in Airbnb when they were really young. Where might someone go to find that out? Yeah, the simplest way, the simplest and free place is Crunchbase. Say more. I mean, you can go search Airbnb and it'll tell you the people who did it. The more professional and you sometimes have to pay in a 30-day trial is PitchBook. So these are two resources, online resources, which generally will list who are the investors in company X. And especially technology-based companies, especially larger companies, the ones we're talking about that venture capital invested in. And, you know, go get your 30-day trial of PitchBook. And if you're getting serious about this, it's worth that subscription because you're going to do this process forever for the life of your company. As soon as you've chosen the decision tree, which is I'm trying to build a venture scale company, and therefore I'm going to raise money from venture style investors, PitchBook is an amazing resource for answering these kinds of questions. So it will tell you who are all the investors at every round of Airbnb and even how much money they invested at each round. And so as you think about your own rounds of funding, you'll be able to deconstruct that. Even inside PitchBook or Crunchbase, it will tell you related companies. Mm. So they'd be like, oh, this is another company. It was kind of like Airbnb. Oh, who were the investors in that company? And oftentimes you're starting to just use almost a breadcrumbing type of strategy to build the target list of investors for each subsequent round of funding and asking yourself the question as a founder, like who, if I could have anybody as an investor in this company, who would I want? And these are 
before you know whether you like them or not, or whether they're smart or not, or whether they give you advice or not. The point is, they clearly have had success investing in a company that has similarity to your company. Mm. I will offer a small sidebar that that is, in fact, exactly what I did with uh, Sir Richard Branson. I was like thinking, wow, who are future people that I would like if I could, you know, we're six months into this company. If I could pick anybody on the planet, that would be a, a, a North Star of like, this business is working if we get people like this on the platform. And in that case, we were very focused on photography and I knew we wanted to go out into design and business and, you know, entrepreneurship and like, wow, Richard Branson would be a total icon because not only has he built lots of businesses, he, his businesses are focused on creativity and design and, you know, transformation and changing the world. And when I actually ended up meeting Richard through a set of circumstances, I had already sort of like, ah, there is a person out there who fits the profile and he happens to be sitting right next to me. I chronicled this in creative calling. It's not worth going going uh, off track here. But my point is that this is exa- as a founder who has exited, this is exactly the mentality that I'm operating. And what TA is saying here, this is exactly how there are people. What have they done? If I could pick one, what would it look, you know, what would he, she, they look like, et cetera. So uh, I'm trying to underscore TA's point here. This is, this is fact. <laughs> uh, maybe it was because you, you mentored me. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe it, so. it, I think you should, everybody who's building any company that is going to raise capital, regardless of where you're going to raise it from, why wouldn't you make that list? Why wouldn't you just say, what are the attributes of my perfect investor? And those attributes are going to be, do they write the right kind of checks? Do they invest in the kind of category that I'm building? And then what else, what knowledge would I want from them? What would I want to learn from them? How could they make my company better in addition to the capital? Mm. And if you, if you can't make the list, you're not thinking about it hard enough. You're not thinking about it. And why wouldn't you just aspire to say, oh my gosh, I want that list. I mean, when, I, when we were doing LifeWell, you remember that company when I shut down, mm. you should share that blog post, by the way, of mm. a company where I had the seed round raised. I made this target list. I had Chase and many of Chase's connections in this round. We had already committed to it. And the day before I started the company, I decided I didn't have enough confidence in it and I didn't take their money and I killed the idea. That was difficult, really yeah. difficult. And I lament it a lot because that was a chance that I was going to get to work with Tim Ferriss, who was on my list. And it took a long time to say, I want <laughs> Tim Ferriss in this company and I want Brad Feld in this company. And I want this person, I want this person, I want this person. I want target list of who do I want in this company. And if this is my chance to get them, how am I going to work really hard to get them? And then to not get to do that is super sad. <laughs> to get but, everybody on your list and decide not to do it was a big yeah. deal. Like, What's yeah. the best place for Let's like embed this, uh, the way to find that post in the episode here. We'll put it in the show notes, but what's a good search if they want to pull up that I, remember uh, the I think title. I think it was uh, how I killed my startup hours before raising my seed round. Okay, I want to see if that pulls hours before. Uh, and it's it's on ta it's on tamccann dot com, and I'll, we'll put it in there as a show notes. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Um, but that that was you know you made the point about Creative Live, and and I did the same thing when I was doing Life Well, and they would not be the same people necessarily. Right. For one idea to the next idea to the next idea, there may be amazing investors, but they may not be domain oriented or they may be the wrong stage or they may not fit into the Venn diagram of all the people I wanted or you might have wanted or any entrepreneur listening might have wanted for this. And it's not always the same. Mm -hmm. You're like, if you did Creative Live all over again, you might say, "Okay, I need some entrepreneur people. I need some creative people. I need some just creative people. And there might be two or three people that are, you're like, I want that person in this slot, like putting a football team together. Like you don't draft the same people for every spot on the team, but you definitely need a quarterback and a wide receiver and a running back and a tackle sure. and make your own target list of who you want to draft and then try and go find them. Brilliant. Two different forks I want to explore now, and I want to try and map this so that we can track it with the time that we have left. One fork that I want to explore is. Uh, I would say sort of abstracting the um, the ideas of how you get to these people. So what, you know, I mean, 
the Tim Ferriss's and Brad Feld's and whatnot. So that's one, you know, one universe. And then the other universe is let's talk about what specifically a pitch to venture capitalist type folks look like. So let's take them in order. Going back to the first one. So I get hit up a lot of times. Hey, Chase, uh, you know, I know you've invested in some companies. I have a um, AI company that I'm trying to get you know, funding for. We need some creative people. I think you'd be a, you know, a really good, interesting advisor, investor for us. Um, you know, our round is here. Here's our pitch materials, blah, blah, blah. Um, I also get a lot of people just saying, hey, Chase, would you review my portfolio? And in some cases, I'm, I, I think that's interesting because the cold email comes in. They've done enough to know that I angel invest a little bit. And I can see if I squint, I can see, yeah, you know, maybe creativity, AI, maybe there's an angle there. And then there's this other type of a mail that says, well, where you review my portfolio and it's like, man, I, I mean, I know you're in the community, but I don't know you at all. And that's like an hour of my time. And, you know, sort of like, what have you done for me? This is such a weird request. You can imagine I get like 40 of those a week, even deciding to entertain one is like a, it's a total nightmare. And yet I get those and have for 15 plus years. So Let's talk about that. How do you contact these people? What looks and smells good? What looks and smells off um, mm -hmm. for you, for others? Yeah. So think about this as like a math equation. So this is basically strength of connection multiplied by strength of narrative and fit. So these are three different components. So one is if I send you something, Chase, even if the idea is terrible, you're likely to look at it because we have a strong connection. Mm -hmm. So if I recommend the entrepreneur independent of the quality of the idea or independent of the fit to you, you're more likely to look at it. Mm -hmm. So number one is strength of connection and warm leads, which is the best way. And if you're really looking to get to VCs, if you don't have that, it's already pretty challenging because I get the same number of those types of things with pitches. If you don't, then you have to then have the strength of narrative which is how compelling is the first email? The, hey, Chase, will you look at my portfolio? Not very strong. <laughs> hey, Chase, I'm specifically doing ski photography and here's one of my best sort of things and here's what I would really like you know, feedback on. Not the whole portfolio, just the, hey, I was thinking about doing this thing or that thing and here's two versions of the same ski photo and which one of these do you think is better for whatever? You know, like It's very strong and pointed in narrative to engage you. And that may either be because I've done the research to figure out that you've done outdoor photography and ski photography, and you're particularly good at these types of things. And I'm looking to engage you. So it's, you have to do a lot more work if you don't have strong connection. And the strong work is both in form of mapping your thing, your request to the response, and making it easy. A lot of people like, hey, I have a weak connection to you, and I'm asking you to do a lot of work. No. <laughs> I have a weak connection to you, but I've highly personalized my outreach to you and I've made it easy for you to engage and easy to engage could be the strength of the narrative to I've sent you, or it's made it easy. Like you don't have to open up the whole deck. You just wrote three bullet points about this company you're talking about. Hey, Tia, I know you invest in quantified health. You've invested in the past. I noticed you invested here. I'm working on a new quantified health thing. And here's the three bullet points of what I'm doing. And I'm raising a million dollars, et cetera, et cetera. So the strength of the narrative gets over the lack of strong connection because I can read it. I'm like, yep, they've already done the research on me. Yes, this is a category I care about. And yes, what they're asking for may not be I'm all the way raising money, but I'm asking for feedback or I'm asking for advice before I ask for money. Brilliant. This is so often a whiff. And where I find, I don't know if this is the case as much because it's been, you know, five plus years since I've raised money, but people missing the categories that particular investors invest in. I have had people reach out to me about semiconductors. I don't know anything about <laughs> semiconductors. Hey, Chase, I know you invest. We're building a semiconductor company. I have great ties to these, you know, amazing factories in Asia. And 
I'm just like, you know, I'm four four words or four sentences into the email and I'm like, dude, you don't know anything about me. I've never in like semiconductors, Chase Jarvis, those things are like oil and water. How do you yeah. how do like a it's just that's that. just lazy. That's just lazy entrepreneurship. Yeah. Right. I mean, and and oh by the way, if I were building the next awesome semiconductor company and I only had 10 slots in my cap table, why would I want you? I wouldn't. <laughs> Right. So, so it's lazy entrepreneurship because it's lazy, not only that they didn't do the work to figure out you don't invest in semiconductors, but even lazier, the fact that they, why would they give up one slot on their cap table for you or me? Cause I don't invest in semiconductors either. Like, what do I know about semiconductors? Nothing. Am I going to be helpful if you only had 10 slots to put on your team? Think about the football team. Like, why would you draft either one of us to play on the Seahawks? You wouldn't. We got a swimmer right. and a soccer player. Right. You wouldn't. <laughs> if you only get 10 slots and imagine that metaphor, then why wouldn't you want to put the best possible person in that slot? And therefore, you should do the work to figure out who would be the best person. And then when you write the email to you, like, this is why I want you with my cool new photography company, Chase. This is specifically where I think you can be helpful. This is specifically why I think you will add value and help this company be great. Then you're, then you're starting to do the mapping of those one of 10 slots. And you may not may want me on your photography company, but you may say, I already have a great photographer who's an entrepreneur, but what I'm really looking for is somebody who understands something else to add to my team. I already have a quarterback. I already have a running back. What I need is a tackle. And mm-hmm. you're the right person for that, which I think I need for this. And you're the best one I can possibly draft. Insight, pure insight. Okay, I feel like we have the deconstructing the right people, positions, whatnot, a little bit on how to reach out to them, some places to look. Uh, I would say sort of the angel list. Uh, can you list any, you know, uh, obviously PSL, uh, if there are overlaps and you guys write, you know, early checks anywhere else you'd want to steer people to? Oh, I mean, think. there's there's many hundreds of many hundreds of seed funds and many hundreds of venture capital investors. And therefore, many of those, I mean, PitchBook is by far the best reference here. Okay. Um, it takes a little bit of effort to do that. It may take a little bit of money, but this is a small investment given this is so such a critical thing and you should spend a lot of time on it. Um, and this will be for every round of your company. So I, I can't really recommend anything better than PitchBook. And we use it religiously here. Uh, it's just a little bit more expensive. The free version of that's going to be Crunchbase. And you can go to AngelList. And there are other angel syndicates in your oftentimes regions. Another way to do this build this list is go find the other successful entrepreneurs in your region or in your category. And most of us want to help each other out, right? And you're like, hey, who invested in your company? How did you find them? Where did you get them? And that type of a thing, they, that may get you down the path of where might I find a better list of potential investors? And these are all just different axes by which to do it. I'm actually going to have uh, the URL to this show highlighted on my desktop so I can cut and paste this into all of the inquiries that come in because <laughs> 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 this is pure gold. Uh, okay. Now I think, you know, one of the exclamation points of today's show we talked about prior to hitting record is like specifically how, so let's say there are people that, um, there for who are this we're recording this episode for for our community they say okay great i like you know i i know that i have a venture scale idea i deconstructed um you know to find out that ta at pioneer square labs in seattle invests in companies like mine um chase jarvis is an angel he's invested in a couple i'm gonna reach out to these people Uh, what do pitches what are sort of the from maybe out, original outreach, we've already talked about how a warm intro, hey, Chase, you know, TA sounds like someone who's right in the sweet spot of an investor that I'm interested in. And, you know, this person knows me, like you said, the strong connection, I can, am I happy to introduce this person to you? We've introduced lots of people to one another over the last, you know, 20 years of our friendship. So from sort of the introductory connection through to sitting down and walking through a deck that you have prepared about this vision for this big company in front of the rest of the PSL crew. What are some of the sort of high points 
that you would share with us about how to pitch? Okay. First, I'm going to call it the the email, the three PI, the three paragraph intro email. And this should be personalized. So the three paragraph intro is what are we doing? Where are we at? What do we need? Okay. So this has to be like tight and punchy. Meaning if I'm writing this about an idea I have is like, what are we doing? Has to be like a couple of sentences. We're building a new supplement company to do blah, 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 blah. Where we at is effectively the traction. Today, we've opened our first store. We've sold 10 things. We are thinking about our second store, et cetera. And the more numbers you can give there, the more what feels like growth, the more you feel like it's getting off the ground, the better. The third is what do we need? And we're raising a million dollars to go open our third store. If you write that email really well, then I can make a decision like, yeah, it's not really my thing. Thanks very much. You should go talk to somebody else. That's an efficient use of your time and my time. Added to a personalization. And TA, this is why I specifically think you would be awesome as an angel investor for this $1 million round for the thing that we're doing. Now, you may have gotten that incorrect, but at least you've personalized it to me or Chase where you made the 3PI might be the same. What are we doing? Where are we at? What do we need? But it's personalized specifically to the investor. If I got that and you said, I want to talk to Chase Jarvis, I'm more likely to forward it to him and say, hey, Chase, would you be open to an intro here? If that person is well known to me, I'm like, this is a super credible entrepreneur, Chase. Look at what they're doing below. I think you should meet them, even if it doesn't feel like it's in your sweet spot. That's that's where I'm putting personal connection on the line on behalf of somebody that I think is great or could be great, or maybe they aren't pitching the idea the right way. But three PI, three paragraph intro, and personalization. So that's the first part. Now let's say that you get the first meeting with me because Chase sent me the same email, which is a three PI. Oh, that's really cool. Like I like that idea. That's an interesting idea. You may include the your investor deck because I can read way faster than you can talk. So oftentimes I will read through the investor deck quickly and I might even respond with, oh, I'd love to set up a meeting, but here's the places where I'm going to focus because I've already read effectively what your company is. It's characterized in your investor deck and there's a thousand templates out there on how to do a good investor deck um, of which we could talk about on a whole different section and another show on building good investor decks. But let's assume it's a marginally good investor deck. Then I'm going to preface, and many people will, with, okay, I'd love to meet with you, hear more. Here are the two or three areas which immediately jump out where I'd like to spend more time. That could be competitive differentiation. It could be traction. It could be how you're finding customers. could be a hundred different things. But from that 3PI, I'm going to get, is this in my category or not? Oh, interesting. It's in my category. It's in my stage. I'm going to read more. Now I'm going to read through that deck, and I'm going to like, hmm, okay. This, I get the story. I get where they are. I like what they're doing. Now let's schedule a meeting. And I'll pause there if you want to ask questions or we can get into the first meeting. I want to pause and ask you, as you continue in your the next phase of this answer, could you make sure to include the subtle subtle distinctions of, well, I already showed him my pitch deck. And my thinking is when I walk into this meeting, I'm going to show my pitch deck because that's what a pitch deck is. So what should I expect in this meeting? If you've already read the pitch deck, am I going to click through the slides one at a time? And like, how ought that be thought about as we go into this first meeting? Yeah, this is so, this is so fun, like to to do. (laughs) Uh, And oh, by the way, you're going to do as a, as a founder, you're going to do this hundreds, if not thousands of times. So you may as well start practicing it and feel, you know, uncomfortable and get better at it and put your own style into it. So you'll find high variability in, let's now say you're coming to do the first meeting with me and I'm just a proxy for a venture investor. You are going to find very high variability in how that first meeting goes. And that variability is going to be based on different styles. It may be based on different interests and it may be based on how busy somebody is. So let's say you sent me your pitch deck three weeks ago. I'm like, yeah, I totally forgot about this thing. And maybe I'm prepared. Maybe I'm not prepared. Maybe I had an assistant. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I briefed myself. Maybe I didn't. Okay. There's one is how prepared am I for that as, as an investor? How prepared am I for that meeting? And you should not judge somebody whether they're, oh my gosh, I went and saw that person. He wasn't even prepared. Couldn't even remember my name. You can like, don't judge by that. 
because you have no idea what's going on in their life or how many deals are doing or what's happening. So just that's one point of variability. Two is stylistic variability. So stylistically, I might be the person that says, hey, I'd love for you to run through your deck again and hear the story. Ben. You're like, Dude, I already wrote, I've already done this three times. I already sent you the deck. Like, why am I doing the deck again? You don't know stylistically how that investor is going to think and what they're looking for. So um, there may be the person and the right way that I tend to do this is as an entrepreneur, you'd say like, hey, Miss Investor, like it's awesome to be here the first time. I know it's our first time getting to know each other. And I can easily, we can just have a dialogue or I could go through the deck if you want to, or we could just start with your questions. It's your choice. Choose your own adventure that, and go with whatever that is. Yeah. And you might just have a very conversational type of first meeting, which is like, Chase, just tell me like, why did you choose this idea? You know, you could have chosen a yeah. hundred ideas. So there's, there's the beginning of how that soft startup happens will be highly varied depending on what the person knows or doesn't what their experience is, what things they are looking for. But almost for sure, regardless of how this soft startup happens, your goal of the first meeting is to get a second meeting. <laughs> your goal of the first meeting is to establish likability, understanding, and trust. Mm -hmm. And if that comes by, let's get into the operational model or how I'm better than my competitor or why I chose this thing or who my team is or whatever, your goal is likability because who wants to invest? I mean, in both directions, like you may as well like, wow, that was really fun. I enjoyed that person. I enjoyed what they're doing. I was excited about it. So likability content, like I, they understand, they don't understand the business really well and trust because we're all about to sign up for a long relationship. And if for whatever reason in the first meeting you bred, not distrust, but sort of like I pushed on a couple of things. And as soon as I pushed on, I'm like, you bullshitted me. And I'm like, <laughs> that person is not necessarily like somebody I want to do business with. So focus on likability, content and trust. Mm. Love every aspect of that answer. Uh, and I feel compelled to share a personal narrative here in hopes of personalizing this for the community that's listening to this show. And I will say my first, um, the well, first of all, you taught me how to put, put a deck together. My first meeting with a venture capitalist was a warm intro from a friend. It was to Mike Moritz at Sequoia. And the meeting went like this. Hey, you know, yeah, sure. It was a very warm intro. Like you said, someone put their personal capital, one of my friends put their personal capital on the line and said, hey, Mike, I want to introduce Chase. He's working on something really interesting. It's a company they already have traction and it's in a you know a fascinating space, which I know Sequoia is interested in. Mike probably was like, okay, again, like you and I have back channel, like, hey, this is interesting enough. Take the meeting. So Mike Moritz was very casual, and I went in not having formal materials, uh, or I had a very basic one that you had instructed me on how to create, and it was like here's the idea. Here's the company. It already exists. Here's how much revenue we're doing. It's kind of interesting. But I, I walked into that meeting and said, Hey, Mike, exactly as you coach just now, how do you want to do this? Like, you know, what is it helpful for us just to have a conversation? You know, my friend who recommended us, you know, thought X, Y, and Z. I also, I do have a short deck here. It's not sort of a formalized, it's really just an idea discussion framework. And, and Mike said, you know, Hey, I'm totally unprepared because I'm just, it's my time is valuable. I didn't do a bunch of research. You're a first time, you know, entrepreneur. Uh, cool. Let's just, yeah, let's, you know, click through your eight page deck or whatever. And partway through this, he was like, God, this is a real business. You're already doing fill in the blank amount of revenue. You already have fill in the blank amount of customers. And I said, yeah. He's like, and what's your vision for the future? And I, A, B, C, F, you know, X, Y, Z. He said, wow, this could be huge. There's someone I want you to meet. And then he introduced me to somebody. So, I share that story because, again, it is exactly as you discussed. I love the intro, which is like, hey, how do you want to pursue this meeting? Or how do you want to proceed with this meeting? Like, what's going to be valuable for your time today? That person then gets a chance to, to uh, articulate that. You just said very uh, astutely, your goal with the first meeting is to get a second meeting. So let's pretend now that you've got this second meeting and you know, I don't want to ride that right off into the sunset, but to me, the second meeting means you're going somewhere. You've got some traction. 
what does the second meeting look like? A- again, you've qualified that as high degree of variability in how the first meeting goes, but talk to us about the second. Yeah, there, you'll find high variability in different investor styles as well. So if you were pitching me, almost always, let's say I liked what you were doing. I'm like, Chase, that was so great. Thank you for the deck. As we discussed in that, I'm really interested in a list of your top five customers and what your average revenue is for blah, blah, blah. And I'll ask you like a bunch of questions and I'll put those in email. And I'm actually judging me like how well you answer my questions. And other people might be, okay, great. Let's just talk about that in the next meeting. And for me, I stylistically will be judging a lot between now and the second meeting. In fact, the email back and forth is like the second meeting. Then I might say, oh, why don't you just spin up a Google Doc and like we'll put some questions and answers in there. And I mean, I'm doing this with investment right now. And I'm I'm judging the back and forth dialogue. And does this feel fun? Does this feel like we're building something together? And if the person, and I can feel sometimes people are like annoyed by that. Like founders are annoyed by that. And I'm like, well, why would we want to work together for the next 10 years if the style, I'm not doing artificially. I'm like, the style is for me to understand the business and to understand how you understand the business. And for both of us to understand what the biggest opportunities are and what the biggest risks are. And let's work on both of those. How do we amplify the opportunities and also mitigate the risks? And if the back and forth on the Google Doc or the next meeting or the whatever isn't fun, isn't interesting, and the entrepreneur isn't walking away going, oh, wow, I'm so much more energized. Yeah, that was hard. We worked on a couple of difficult things. I asked some really good questions, but we started working on it together because that entrepreneur is like, wow, this is my tight end. Like, this is awesome. (laughs) And he's going to be particularly helpful in these particular kind of categories. And so the second meeting is usually one of two flavors. Again, whether it's an online or, or a real meeting, it is either socializing the idea to a broader set of people. So, hey, I'd like to get you to come back next Monday. I want you to meet more of my partners so that they can give some perspective on this thing. That's a socializing idea. And you'll be like, yep, start, starting all over again. You know, <laughs> same thing. Hey, y'all, how would you like me to do this? I can do my deck. I can answer questions. You know, Mike, let's use Mike in your case. Mike asked me some very specific things about future vision or current economics or whatever questions you had. So we could either work on the questions that Mike asked me and I have some better answers for those. I've thought about them a little bit more. I have slide 11 in my deck where I can deal with that. Or I can do the whole thing all over again, or I can just talk you through like this and we can do a Q and a it's up to you. And then your partner, Mike, in this case would probably instruct you in how to do that. Like, yeah, what chase, why don't you just do the deck again? Make sure to hit that point on slide eight. That was so compelling. uh, And then we'll see where it goes. That's one type of meeting. And that, whether that's a second or third or fourth or fifth, th- that meeting, especially for a venture capital firm, is highly likely to happen. They would call that you know, you know, socializing to a broader group. The other type of meeting is going to go deeper in a category. Like, hey, we really, I really want to understand the unit economics of this business. And I did, it's not as well thought of or articulated in slide 11. And so I really want to spend the majority of our time here on that topic how we acquire customers, competitive differentiation, how you're going to hire people, you know, a hundred different topics. So that second meeting could be thought of as a working session, which should, again, have energy in both directions. Like the founder should be like, God, that was a, such a good working meeting. And, and it's, it's so frustrating now as a, because a good investor almost always finds the weakest aspect of a company, like very quickly. <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, that's my soft spot. That's my weak <laughs> spot. I, how do you know it so quickly? And in many ways, the best investors find those very quickly and say, okay, doesn't mean it's a no. It's just like, let's go work on that. Let's go understand it. And they'll find the weak spot and they'll also find the most exciting parts of the business and they'll amplify that, but they'll want to spend time on the working toward the weak parts of the business, the risks in the business, the things why it won't work as opposed to the reasons it will. Last question on that front is when investors push on these difficult areas, areas where you know you're weak or where you don't have a lot of good information, I find that there's a couple of ways to handle those questions. What would you recommend uh, to the people out there listening when an investor starts to push on these difficult areas? Well, I would do the work and keep doing the work, even if the work is not yet adequate. 
right? So, you know, the question, uh, I don't understand your econ- economics very well. Okay, Mike, I actually worked on a spreadsheet to do this a little bit better. And here's how I'm thinking about it. And then Mike asks more questions about that. And you do more work on it. And then you say, Mike, are there people in your network that actually have solved this problem much better than I have? I'd love to talk to those people. Hey, Mike, what are other examples of this that I can do better? So you have to do the work, assuming that you agree with the weakness. Now, in most cases, that investor is right, and they're not, they don't want to waste your time or theirs because they got plenty of things to do. So they're not doing it just for sport. They're doing it because they want to understand the business, and they do perceive a weakness in the business. So do the work. Do the work and iterate through it. And presumably, if they're asking good questions, then your company will be better, even if they don't invest. Because you're like, you know what? Oh, my gosh. I got like, I spent so many hours figuring out the unit economics of this business. And I did a spreadsheet and another one and more detail and this and four different examples. And I talked to three other founders and all that. Man, I I freaking know that thing now. (laughs) And then, you know, another investor, another investor. And, you know, this opportunity to make your business better with every investor pitch and every investor meeting. Because every time you pitch it, it's going to be like better or different. And someone's going to tell you to do a verbal narrative and someone's going to make you do your deck and someone's going to just do a Q&A back and forth and you feel like you're all over the map. But in their mind, they're assembling a story. And all of this is just like, you know, like a boxing match. And you're like, whoa, I got better at every one of those maneuvers. And I could tell the story from purely narrative. I could tell it in a linear way. I could tell it in a this thing, then this thing, then this thing, then this thing, and re-summarize it in a narrative way. And you're like, well, I got all those skills now. And I got mm-hmm. those because I went to good investor meetings and they let me do it in lots of different ways that is different for them. And so the next time you get the narrative person, the next time you get the deck person, the next time you get the spreadsheet person, you're just that much better. So a lot of these sort of meetings are, are making the company better and making you better as a founder especially if they're, you know, you're managing it the right way and they're asking good questions. Do the work. Wow. Thank you very, very much. We are what I would consider maybe like one third of the way through what's coming, what's turning out to be like a series on, you know, how to think about getting OPM, other people's money to support the vision that you have, that you want to put something out into the world and make you know, make an impact. Um, thank you very, very much to you. Again, I want to point back to our earlier show. If you jumped in mid mid show here and you missed our conversation at the beginning about this, we have an, uh, a previously recorded show where we talked a lot about how to decide whether your, your, um, your interests uh, would command uh, other people's money to grow and thrive, or if you should bootstrap it. And we've really done a nice job. I still think as a primer, we'll call it the 102 version of um, how to actually move forward with that process. If you do believe that you are, again, someone who's interested in in uh, in connecting with other investors who would share your vision on the venture scaled aspect. So um, any, you know, that was a really insightful way to, to wrap up on your last point, TA, just the way to think about it, getting better as an entrepreneur, getting better, your company's getting better, you're getting stronger. These are sort of repetitions, if you will. If you're a weightlifter, you're getting some reps. Anything else you'd like to say as a wrap up to today's show? Uh, and I'll, of course, tease tease our future episodes. Um, but anything else you'd like to share? I think that's I think that's it for today. But I've, I've really enjoyed it. I love talking about this subject area, and I think good founders. Good founders really enjoy this because you're usually sitting across the table from someone who has a tremendous amount of experience building businesses, being successful in businesses, and even more so your kind of business. And how fun is it if you're that kind of a founder to be able to accelerate your learning by doing this and getting that sort of perspective, getting those kinds of questions, working through a better answer, and it should give you energy as a founder through this whole process of like, wow, I met 10, 20, 50, 100 people. They asked me all these questions. And by answering those questions, I got better. The business got better. And it gave us a better chance of success. Brilliant. Thank you so much for being another guest on the show, my good friend. Until next time, from T.A. McCann and myself up here in slightly overcast Seattle, we bid you adieu until next time.